Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to our presentation, uh, talking interoperability session today that we are having uh, our focus in Ghana. So uh, just some explanation of what is the series, some explanation of uh, where we are, but as I mentioned, to start with, welcome. Welcome you uh, all of you. We are extremely happy uh, to see the continued interest in uh, the series and these activities. And we're always uh, very excited when one of these events happen. We're trying to keep it monthly, but I will get into that uh, soon. So uh, here is today's agenda. Uh, the welcome that we're doing now, uh, a very short presentation of where we're at, uh, how we're doing it, and then the uh, longer and uh, uh, point of the whole day, the presentation by Ghana. Then we'll have a discussion with some uh, people that have prepared uh, some elements to enrich our experience here with the discussion. Then we'll revert back to you with uh, a Q&A with the audience, and we wrap up with closing remarks uh, by um, two o'clock. Uh, of course, the time uh, is relative to all of us. So some uh, uh, small elements that need to be mentioned, the, the housekeeping rules. Uh, we ask you to uh, please, when you want to comment or to ask questions, you do it in the Q&A box. Uh, you can share any comments or, or even resources, documents, links, this type of thing in the chat. And we do have simultaneous interpretation. This symbol here is uh, where you can find the button for that, where you can choose your language and you can select the language in the uh, uh, interpretation icon on the control bar. We have in, uh, English, French and Spanish available, as well as a channel for the original audio. As you probably have realized, this session will be recorded. And of course, uh, that means that if you're here, uh, we assume you are uh, in agreement with that. And um, that is also extremely important for us to provide afterwards uh, these results and this debate to a broader audience. Now, who are we and what are we doing here? Uh, uh, this is being organized by the Digital Convergence Initiative, uh, DCI for short, uh, for short, and it, this is a joint effort by USP 2030 members, Universal Social Protection by 2030 uh, members, and non-members, also governments, development partners, and private sector. And this uh, coalition, this uh, initiative, um, it tries to create or tries to help to create a harmonized and interoperable digital ecosystem for social protection. Uh, we try to build consensus-based standards for interoperability in order to foster an ecosystem for innovation by ICT solution providers to build products that are interoperable, easy to use, easy to integrate, easy to maintain, and easy to scale. Uh, we hope this will help uh, uh, transversally to reduce time and costs of developing solutions at the country or program level, and also to enable programs and countries to mix and match different components from different suppliers. Uh, we hope to ensure that the systems that are being developed and that are being funded by uh, many of the, those involved uh, we hope that these systems are future-proof by design and, of course, regardless of the levels of policy and the maturity of the information systems and the institutions doing it. So, uh, in order to do that, we can uh, go forward with the slides 
And we will show that this series of talking interoperability is happens, as I mentioned, uh, practically every month. It's a series that was set up by the DCI to facilitate the in-depth technical conversations around integrated and interoperable social protection information systems across countries. And we hope with this format, to allow for a deep dive into one country level system per session uh, in order to share the technical nuts and bolts of how the agencies, the institutions have designed their social protection information systems, and especially, of course, how they deal with the necessary interoperability. Uh, we hope with this to understand how agencies have tackled these major challenges of this crucial issue of interoperability. And of course, with the interactive uh, element of the session, we hope to brainstorm potential solutions to bottlenecks that are often uh, analog in different places. Uh, as I mentioned, the recordings of the past sessions remain available. And you have here in this link, uh, the, the links where you can find that. And now you might be asking, OK, but it's a two hours long session, and I'm going to have to see the recordings. Well, we also thought of that. Uh, you will also find a free four page uh, note sheet where we have managed to synthesize what has been discussed. So you can have a look at that and then watch the recording if you think that applies to your case. Uh, as you see, we're trying to uh, uh, synthesize and, and summarize, but also to provide a collection of use cases, a collection of reflections that can be useful to our community. So having said that, we are extremely happy to have you here. We're excited to see uh, the Ghana session and I will pass on uh, to my colleague, uh, which will appear his photograph in the next slide, uh, Luis Signaki Albero Encinas. He's a senior social protection specialist from the World Bank and he will be moderating the section. So, Luis, over to you, and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rodrigo. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here and to go have this deep dive uh, into Ghana's uh, integrated social protection information system. Um, so we have a, a very good discussion coming forward. Uh, I'll present our presenters and discussants. We have three presenters and two discussants that will um, uh, walk us through the presentation and, and the discussion. Um, our uh, 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 first presenter is uh, Asante Bonti Takra Amuako. He is an MIS specialist consultant and currently works for the Ghana Jobs and Skills Project with the responsibility to, to build the Ghana Libre Market Information System. He has previous experience in building systems for the livelihood empowerment against poverty, the Ghana National Household Registry the Single Window Citizen Engagement Services, and other um, information systems. Uh, next, we have uh, Kingsley Owusu. Uh, Kingsley is the head of the IT unit under the Research Statistics and Information Management of the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection in Ghana. He drives the information technology functionality of the ministry and provides technical input in the digitalization agenda of the ministry's business process. And he also serves as systems administrator for a number of systems, including the social welfare information system at the ministry. Also, as our last uh, presenter, we have uh, Samuel uh, Boakie Marfo. He's a, a principal social development officer at the, or the same uh, Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection with over 10 years of experience in design, implementation, and monitoring regulation of social protection. Uh, he has uh, provided technical backstopping and support for strengthening social protection systems in Ghana, uh, and he has led the design of the ministry's COVID-19 uh, response plan amongst uh, other uh, projects. Um, and he also oversaw the design of the national social protection monitoring and evaluation system. So these are our presenters. Um, I'll also introduce our discussants uh, that will um, uh, participate in the discussion after the presentation. We have uh, Aaron Duta. He's a senior health specialist with the Asian Development Bank. 
supporting knowledge generation and project implementation across subregions in Asia and the Pacific. His focus area um, uh, across previous roles involving support to countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia uh, have been on health financing, health economics, and primary health care. And his recent um, emphasis is on technical assistance projects at the IDB uh, on uh, digitalization and health financing. And finally, uh, we have uh, Lubasi Musambo. Um, he is the MIS technical advisor in the Department of Social Welfare at the Ministry of Community Development and Social Services uh, in charge of the Zambia Integrated Social Protection Information System, ZISTIS. And this is a comprehensive end-to-end -end database of all beneficiaries classified by household who are deemed the most vulnerable in the Republic of Zambia. So these are, this is our wonderful panel that will be uh, uh, joining us today. Uh, with this, I hand over to Asante so he can uh, walk us through the presentation. Over to you, Asante. Hello, yes, good afternoon to you, all of you. And thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this exercise or presentation. I don't know if you can all hear me. We can. Okay, thank you. So as it as, as stands now, I'm probably going to share with you some of the um, technology innovations that we have done across board on the Ghana social protection systems. Um, as I was, I was introduced, I have worked severally with some social protection systems across Ghana, and it will be good for me to share on this platform some of the innovations that have come far and probably also learn from the team as we move ahead to make sure that we operationalize all systems or integrate them. Next slide. So the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection is basically the ministry which is responsible for social protection activity as the name sounds. Um, we, we are basically supposed to make sure that we promote the survival, social protection and development of children, vulnerable and excluded persons with disabilities and integrate for fulfillment of their rights, empower them fully and let, help them also to participate in national development. It's ensuring that the ministry has adequate resources to perform its mandate. There's a need for the availability and use of timely data to make sure that we can make informed decisions as we move ahead to implement all these uh, objectives. Next slide. Basically, the composition of the ministry stands at this. Um, you probably have the headquarters. Um, we have the Department of Gender, Department of Children, Department of Social Welfare, LEAP Secretariat, which is a program that is being run on a cash transfer, um, National School Feeding Program, National Adoption Authority, Ghana National Household Registry, nonprofit organization responsible for NGO registration, and, and the National Council of Disabilities as well. We also have in line about five directories, including the research, statistics, and information systems, and all other departments and agencies under the ministry. Next slide. So in the context of Ghana, um, basically you can see as just beneath the Africa map, a small country where with some huge population. And you can see the regional focus. We have about 16 regions and um, constituting about 271 districts across Ghana. Um, and we are supposed as a ministry to be able to help the vulnerable and poor in society across those, all these um, regions. Next slide. Under the social protection, which is also a directorate, there has been a lot of innovations and key performances that have been at least established within the ministry. And some of the social protection programs that are being currently run is a livelihood empowerment against poverty, we call LEAP, 
and it's targeted at the poor and the vulnerable in society across Ghana. And it's being led by the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection. Currently, we've been able to cover about 345,021 households, which culminates into 1.5 million individuals across Ghana. Then we have the labor intensive public works as well, which is also targeted towards the poor and the vulnerable. It is also being implemented by the Ministry of Local Government Decentralization and Rural Development under the Ghana Productive Safety Net Project. Currently, under GPS MP2, um, we've so far been able to cover about 34,579 individuals, either to under G uh, GPS MP1, labor intensive public waste covered almost about 166,000 projects and almost about 5 million individuals um, as we speak. Then we come to the National Health Insurance Scheme. It is a universal uh, social protection intervention that is being implemented by the government of Ghana and is being run by the Ministry of Health. Currently, uh, out of the population of 30 million, you'll be able to cover more, more than half, which is about 50 million individuals who are registered under the National Health Insurance Authority. And the Ghana Productive Safety Net Project as well, there's a component called the Productive Inclusion, where our target is probably to be able to help people to complement with other social interventions that are being run in the country. And it's also targeted to the poor and the vulnerable. This is also being implemented by the Ministry of Local Government, Decentralization and Development. Currently, as it stands, we have about 21,000 individuals who have benefited from um, this program. Then we do have the Ghana School Feeding Project. Ghana is targeted at the public schools and children nationwide. And it's being run by the Ministry of Gender, Children and Social Protection. And currently, as it stands now, we have about 10,000 schools and about 3.6 million people in the private and public schools benefiting from this. Then we also have the Basic Education Capitation Grant. This is it's also a support to help public schools, especially in the infrastructure and the delivery of service. This is also being done by the Ministry of Education. Currently, we have about 43,328 schools, um, which culminates into about 5.9 million people benefiting from the program. Next slide. Yes, yeah, so basically to be able to implement things like that, you definitely might need some information systems to complement the efforts and the processes of the social protection enclave. And one of the critical common digital infrastructure that have been put in place to complement the activities of the ministry, it's um, a common identification system, which is basically run by the National Identification Authority. This is a government initiative that requires every individual to be registered with its um, biometric data, captured individual um, personal profiles is also captured. Then you'll probably be able to identify each, each member or each individual in the country with a unique identifier. Currently, as it stands now, about 52% 50, of the population are so far be able to register on the national ID card. Government is also rolling a policy to make sure that by, if you want to even operate an account in Ghana, if you want to run a mobile service, if you have a mobile handset you are using to receive calls and stuff like that, using the internet, you still have to be able to get your national identification ID before you can be able to assess services of that. Then, to be able to target beneficiaries very well, especially the poor and the vulnerable, there was also the need to create what we call the social registry, so that at least individuals who are poor and vulnerable in society can be targeted well based on evidence-based um, data. That is also currently being done by the Ghana National House Registry. But according to the GLS-7, um, we've covered most of the poorest countries or regions in Ghana, and um, the five northern regions, which is considered to be the poorest in the Ghana, have been covered. Currently, we are 
wind central and volta region to complete um, the registry. Then once you're able to select your beneficiaries and you want to run a cash transfer, that uh, centralized common payment platform, which is also being done by the Ghana Inter Payment and Settlement Systems um, under the Bank of Ghana for the payment of cash transfer in any social protection service that might come across. Irrespective of all these protect, uh, social protection interventions that are being put in place, there's always a likelihood that beneficiaries will have complaints. And as to how we are able to resolve these complaints on time became very necessary. And for that matter, um, the ministry decided to put up what we call the grievance redress platform, um, a single point of entry for all social protection interventions and any other, so that beneficiary can have access to um, redress resolution platforms and make sure that their, their issues are addressed on time. The integrated beneficial registry that was posted here, I am, I am sure that the government of Ghana is still in the process to be able to formalize that. Civil registration system also under development. We are hoping that as we move ahead, these systems will come to complement the others that have been created. That's right. So introducing Ghana, these are some of the existing platforms that we do have. I've talked about the GNHR, Ghana National Household Registry Platform. It's for sharing data on beneficiaries. And LEAP Management Information System is for beneficiary management and payroll generation as well. Labor Intensive Public Works is also for project management and payroll. Then we have the Ghana Statistical Service Data which is also supposed to help in and, um, data collection, especially for GSS, for GNHR. Then we have the Social Protection Management Information System. This is basically a monitoring platform to monitor the activities and also ensure that key performance indicators by um, various agencies or program are being monitored um, across board and on the web portal for and decisions to be made out of them as we move ahead. Then the Citizens Engagement Service, Single Window Citizens Engagement Service is the redress mechanism systems that is for managing cases across social protection and beyond. Currently, we have also have support for the Orange, Orange support platform for those domestic activities, domestic violence activities. Then we do have the National Identification Authority as well. National Health Insurance Authority systems that are also in place. Next slide. So this is basically some of the interfaces of the systems that are being implemented or that, that is live now. Um, the helpline of hope, um, Ghana National Health Registry, the monitoring dashboard, social welfare service directory, which is also supposed to locate NGOs and other agencies who are working across Ghana. So in case somebody receives a call from um, any beneficiary through the toll-free line, is able to tell, um, use the social service directory to identify NGOs or agencies who are willing to help a beneficiary who is in dying. Next slide, please. So I talked about the Ghana National Household Registry, which is one of the main focus for targeting of beneficiaries of the vulnerable and poor in society. This was launched in the year 2015. Currently, we have about um, 809 households covered. Our database has images of beneficiaries, and the main database is about 3.5 terabyte. It includes an uh, initial registration process, and we are able to run a PMT check to categorize beneficiaries into poor, extreme poor, and unpoor. Um, we, we have a grievance redress mechanism, which is also integrated with the SWES to make sure that we are in sync with cases that come, especially on inclusion and exclusion errors uh, on the field. Then we have 
a field operation management systems within GNHR to monitor the activities and also advise management as we move ahead. Next slide, please. So basically, the mandate of GNHR is to establish a single national household registry, also facilitate and engage the registry to other SP programs. And I'm happy that we are having these discussions because um, in Ghana, that is basically one of the mandates to make sure that the registry is connected to a lot of systems that are running social protection for um, efficient targeting. We're also supposed to promote widely usage of the data for research policy and planning. The ministry makes policy decisions and is evident to have a data that can be able to speak to uh, issues on the ground. Next slide. Architecture, um, basically on the data side, is this, um, this looks more technical, but this is built on relationship with how the database is being queried and, and relational database for that matter. Next slide. On the bit of security, and um, because we want to run um, this fully by ourselves, um, maybe the technical team of the ministry, we are running on the infrastructure of the National Information Technology Agency. The National Information Technology Agency is a, a data hub where all government institutions store their data and make sure they use those resources. This was under the e-government project um, where every individual or every agency or ministry is supposed to host its infrastructure at the site. So we are co-located at that infrastructure. We have our own side also at the ministry, which does the backup. And we have firewalls to protect the data and also help in authentication. We use strong passwords and we do backups to another third side to make sure that um, in case of any emergency or eventuality, we are able to safeguard all the data. Next slide. Single Window Citizens Engagement Service. It's the redress mechanism platform. And basically, to be able to help, to be able to help um, individuals or beneficiaries use multi channels to be able to create their cases or report issues that uh, they might need solutions. So, um, looking at a beneficiary target, we realize that most of them do not have phones. So basically what has been implemented within the regions across the district is to use what we call the community focal person who is handled or given the mobile phone. And once you have the access to any of these phones during work or any activity, the beneficiary has the possibility to call the line toll free. We pay for the services. And once it comes to the platform or the office through the toll free line, we use a unified case management system to be able to create a case and refer the cases to the various agencies with an SLA to be able to work there, work on it on time. So this is basically also based on the service level agreement on each case types that comes in. We are supposed to make sure that all the cases that have been created, all the cases that have been input on the system has a basic SLA. If after the SLA is exhausted or expired, um, it's escalated to the superior until resolution is given. Once still we do not have any resolution to a beneficiary consent, it is pushed to a committee for redress on such matters. So this is basically the architecture of the case management system that is being run by the ministry. And it brings into bear most of the processes of the various agencies, especially when it comes to case management systems. Next slide. Basically, these are the action points of the case management officer. Our responsibility as a platform is to make sure that we refer the cases to the agencies who are involved for quick resolution. And in that, we manage teams, we manage tasks as well. We resolve the cases. We try to escalate cases by the system. And to improve on the system, we expect to have feedback as and when we move ahead. 
Next slide. The social protection da dashboard is basically to monitor some of the key performance indicators across the social protection enclave. Uh, so once we are doing well, and this is done through API integrations with various systems, it's not by any upload or of the sort. We have tried to integrate with both social protection existing systems to be able to pull the data sets or the endpoints and probably bring them under one data warehouse, visualize them and show the performance indicators. And we do that by color codes. Once we are doing well, you can see a green sign which tells you that it's improving. If you are not doing well, it means that there's a red indication that shows that there's more, uh, more room for improvement. Next slide. Again, it involves all the social protection interventions across Ghana. As we move ahead, if there's any social protection interventions, we would add them onto this platform. Make sure we can be able to monitor the key performance indicators as we move ahead. Next slide. Ghana have not integrated the existing systems. Most of the systems are running in silos. And another Ghana Productive Mid Safety Net Project, one of the key things to do is to make sure that we integrate them together, we'll be able to share resources and probably reduce some of the administrative costs that the various systems are run. And I'm particularly happy that a platform like that is also championing that cause. I'm sure we'll be able to learn much more from this platform and also help improve the systems as we integrate them. Next slide. So what are the needs of interoperability and what was it, was it designed to meet? Basically, once other systems, technology is expensive, once other systems are running in the silos, there are always possibilities of a cost. And also to consider that the interventions that we are running are for the poor and vulnerable, and hence we shouldn't be using much of the money into building systems that are running in silos. So the interoperability was basically to help reduce administrative costs, also help resolve beneficiary concerns on time as per the um, single window citizen engagement service that was introduced with an SL. And also when it comes to the bit of payment, we also want to make sure that we reduce the burdens of the beneficiaries. Sometimes they have to travel a long distance to be able to assess their money. But in this case, the Ghana Interpayment Banking Systems would have to drive through a local bank to the community and do disbursement on a POS. We are also supposed to generate evidence-based information for decision-making, which is key. Once other systems are running, there are, there are systems in silos. Sometimes even during meetings, it becomes difficult to require information from those agencies. But if it's at a centralized point, the possibility to have this ones and make decisions out of that on time. Definitely, we need to improve on efficient targeting. Targeting is a key concern especially on social protection interventions. And on this platform, we seek to make sure that targeting is efficient and we are able to select the right beneficiaries for social protection interventions. Again, as we move ahead, we want to share and update records of um, individual beneficiaries. Poverty is phenomenal. It can move and it can change at any time. As we put those interventions, we also want to make sure that if some individuals or beneficiaries are able to graduate out of poverty, which will be a quick concern for the ministry as it drives the agenda for social protection. Next slide. So basically what are the benefits we envisage due to interoperability? A lot more I can say, but just a few that we have outlined here. We, we know that as we are able to do this, um, resources will be efficient, shared across all social protection interventions. We'll be, be able to run systems very well. We will not increase resources, we will improve on uh, technological change to make sure that our systems are running optimally. We'll, uh, we are sure that we'll make a lot of savings in expenditure. Beneficiaries save from having to travel to centers, as I said, and obviously when 
those things are reduced, you make the beneficiary happy. We we'll also want to improve then the targeting of beneficiaries so that it's not politically influenced. We also make, want to make sure that at least at the end of the day, case management is efficient. And out of that, we can make decisions which are effective for national development as well. In all this regard, we expect to make sure that our key performance indicators are monitored appropriately. Next slide. So mapping data is changed across key systems. And as I said, each of the program uh, uses a common identification system, which is a national identification. And um, most of them by, by plan or design is supposed to seek all their beneficiaries from the social registry from program one to program four as mentioned. Um, all of them are using the Griffin's Redress platform, which is a web portal, and they have the possibility to be able to assess cases and cases referred to them for them to work on time. For the integrated beneficiary registry and the civil registration system as indicated, these are still under development. We are hoping that it can be done to complement the effort of the social protection. Next slide. Data standard, which is a key priority in data management. The Data Protection Act of 2012 in Ghana and gives us that willingness or right to be sure that we protect the data subject. And again, before we were able to do that for purpose of continuity, we are finalizing our data dictionary because we changed the architecture to fit the purpose of data management. Most of the time, if you want to do any changes to uh, uh, our data standards, there's always an engagement with various technical team members. And once that is done, um, we would ensure that they have access to the current decisions that have been made and through those technical committees meetings that we do have. This access to all the standards are probably placed on a cloud base and all technical members do have access to review them and also make suggestions. So compliance with standards, as I said, eight principles of data security and privacy as stipulated by the Data Protection Act in Ghana is being followed. One of the critical things we consider to make sure that interoperability becomes successful is the update of beneficiary records. And again, we are relying on stakeholders who do come for our data. There's a data sharing protocol that um, mandates you to share with us any update as you go ahead on the fold to put up your interventions. And because of that, the Ghana National Household Registry has developed an app for updates. We are also in talks with the National Identification Authority, which is a decentralized authority in the district assembly to also help us to do updates through the social welfare offices across the regions and districts. Next slide. The A data protection principles, as I said, um, which is key for us, we, we make sure that all those principles are followed and we make sure that the data subject has a right and its right is protected to the best mean. Next slide. So when it comes to data management, defining and managing interoperability interfaces. Yes, so most of the systems, as I said, um, are, are integrated using APIs. Some of them were doing point to point, but realized that it was important for us to build APIs to integrate into their systems where we either um, update or create records. And once those, those things are done, we are able to update our data sets as we move ahead. Most at time, especially on GNHR requests are made through an HTTPS. And sometimes we generate a token through the system for stakeholders who are requiring our data to be able to pull the data sets as we move ahead. 
Yes, we have a technical committee um, within the social protection enclave. And once any updates are done, we we refer it to various technical team members to probably update the API documentations as we move ahead. I'm sure there will be better approaches as to how we deal with this as we move ahead. Maybe some few concerns and um, uh, learning outcomes probably will be shared as we move ahead. Yes, yeah, so we have a data exchange protocol which mandates us as to how we share the data with our stakeholders. And in that, we have a manual. We do have integration approaches that uses web services and API. As I indicated, sometimes we do point to point. And also, we considering the chance of even when we are even expanding our procedures to build a proper data house with an ETL. Access control, you probably be able to have access to our systems. Um, includes API integrations, as I said, with the token. The data subject is a quick consent to us. So consent management, as when we are going to collect data, is also key for us. And we make sure that we follow the principles of the Data Protection Act as spelled out in the documentation. A unique identifier is used as a protocol to identify authenticate members. In that tool, we're using biometrics to be able to validate members or beneficiaries as they move ahead. And especially on the payment platform, it is only by the biometrics that you are able to um, authenticate for payments to be done to you and um, in your locality. Next slide. Privacy and security, a key concern for us. Um, as we try to integrate or integrate with other systems across Ghana and beyond, there are issues on data protection and we make sure that we do them. Even on the home, backups are always done. We use strong powers. There's always a need for dissemination to be able to protect key infrastructure. And firewalls are always available. Encryption to data sharing is also considered and the principles of DPC is enforced under security and privacy rules. Next slide. Challenges, obviously running systems like that, a lot of challenges do come in, but as we run from our plan, we started with a program design where we had the opportunity to meet all the other agencies. We've gone through the strategy and governance, whether it's any government policy to buy in, or to regulate that. Now currently we are doing the technology and data. And once we are able to do that, um, we may probably want to consider how best we secure ourselves and the subject, data subject rights and how we can also share data to our stakeholders. Next slide. So key challenges that has always been there, commitment of key stakeholders, government agencies, sometimes it's quite difficult to get people seated to make sure they do that. But through the effort of team building, we'll be able to um, come out with solutions, motivations, and continuous engagement to see that um, interoperability is important for us as we move ahead. System reliability and resources. Yes, definitely once we come together as a team to make sure that our system works better, um, resources or as we move ahead, resources or the data keeps on increasing. And there's a need for us to be able to build on our resources. Technology is always changing. How we be able to make sure that we go with the emerging trends of technology to be able to maintain our systems. That's also a key concern for us. And most time we want to identify the right technical team members to help in the support of that. Because of the API integrations, data sharing, privacy and security, there's always a concern about MOUs with various agencies to understand why we want to integrate into their system. And that's one of the critical things that keeps on delaying our processes in interoperability. Next slide. 
a roadmap as to how winter we do the interoperability is to make sure that we have great infrastructure and data standards. And we also want to seek to finalize on the engagement of key stakeholders, especially the technical men and any other agencies that will require or might need or consume their resources as well. We'll review interface to be added. There are new indicators that are coming up. There are new interfaces that we might think that will be helpful as we move in developing systems like that for national use. And we need also to put our concerns across. Then we, as technical team members, once you're able to do this three steps, we want to finalize on the design and assign responsibilities with technical team members as we move ahead. Text design and integrate, then we can deploy and maintain for better interoperability. That's right. Yes, once the ministry is in charge of the social protection and cliff, it has a responsibility to make sure that standards are, are followed. And in doing that, the ministry wants to have a standard template for department agencies who do not have systems running to be able to capture essential data and probably put them into a data warehouse, probably define KPIs and be able to visualize them for key decision makers um, um, for, for the ministry. We also want to bear on the right on the back of some business intelligence tools to be able to give the granular data of uh, data that comes in so we can be able to prescribe and describe some of the key indicators or insights out of the data that we do collect. Next slide. So this is a conceptual view of how we want to do things. And seeing that most other agencies are running their system in silos, make sure that we can be able to bring all of them together and we can generate good reports and good insights. We can update the system, can visualize key indicators and probably show some intelligence that will be helpful as we move ahead. Next slide. And a bit of the ministry, yes, all department agencies, secretaries under the ministry have the individual data collection. We hope to be able to consolidate them and digitalize them as well, because the government agenda of digitalization. The departments and agencies that do run manual systems would make efforts to improve in coordination. So at the end of the day, we can be able to bring all these people to a centralized point or help them to upload those data sets within the systems that we tend to deploy. That's right. So our way forward as a ministry, identify KPIs, finalize them, create a data warehouse, develop the warehouse structure and architecture, procure infrastructure or write on the existing infrastructure, improve on them. Then make sure that at least we bring some technical team members. Obviously, maybe a good platform like this will help validate some of the things that we want to put across. That's right. I think my next slide says thank you. And I'm very happy for your attention. And thank you for this. Many thanks, Asante. Uh, uh, thank you so much for this very rich presentation. Um, I think uh, it was very clear, and I'm I'm uh, amazed by the breadth of of the architecture of of social protection information systems in Ghana, uh, having this uh, decentralized platforms, the social registry, the GRM, the payments platform, and also these program specific uh, beneficiary operation management systems, uh, among among uh, other systems that you you mentioned um maybe with this we could uh then uh, begin our discussion um for that um we have uh, as we mentioned uh two discussants uh Arne and Lubasi uh, that have joined us 
And maybe I'll hand over first to Aaron so, so he can uh, 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 kick us off with some, some initial questions. Over to you, Aaron. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Louis. And uh, thanks to Kakra for that excellent uh, presentation. And it's a pleasure to be um, listening to uh, issues around Ghana, a country I worked on a while ago. So I'll start us off with some questions more on the policy side. And since I'm a health specialist, uh, permit me to, to also focus a little bit on health as an aspect of social protection. So I noticed uh, that one of the, the schemes that has the largest uh, coverage, and uh, we know this scheme well, is NHIS uh, at about 50% plus. Uh, so perhaps it wouldn't be hard to see NHIS as, as a big driver of the interoperability agenda. And uh, one of my questions is looking at NHIS and LEAP, which uh, we understand drives the mean tested identification of the core poor, uh, who then become the NHIS uh, health insurance exemption uh, beneficiaries. How is the interoperability between these two systems, especially given their core link in policy working? And uh, Kakra, you mentioned that one of the hopes of the interoperability agenda is to drive better targeting. So um, if, if you could also comment on whether early indications are that interoperability is helping with uh, better targeting between these two schemes, um, you know, driving down both inclusion and exclusion errors. I'll stop there, thanks. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much for the question. Yes, and it's one of the critical things. I think we finalized an MOU with the National Health Insurance bit. The National Health Insurance has a category called the indigent category, which in the registry, Ghana National Health Registry, is considered as the extreme poor. I, as I earlier indicated, then once we're able to con collect socioeconomic data across using a census approach across every region or district, we use a PMT to run those calls and categorize them in poor, extreme poor, and unpoor. An extreme poor category is what the National Health Insurance considers as indigent. And by policy, they are supposed to register each individual who is an indigent or extreme poor for free. So we have been able to integrate with their system and they are, they are always ready to pull up, pull extreme poor categories and probably share those data across the district in Ghana and register those beneficiaries for free. Once they do that and they go through those districts to do the registration, they are also supposed to help us according to the sharing protocol to update any basic fields that they might also chance on, which would obviously help our database to be updated as we move across. I don't know if I have answered your question. Yes, yes, that that's, uh, sounds like a very positive uh, development. Obviously, I think when you have the single household registry uh, and, and that covers more of the population, you said 800,000 at the moment, uh, once it gets up to closer to 80% coverage, the information backflow from the NHIS system, especially around the indigents, and then the layer of uh, LEAP, uh, you know, continuing to identify the core poor, I think you will have a very good integrated uh, knowledge of, the, of who the poor are in Ghana and where they live. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron and, and, and Asante. Um, maybe uh, also let's hear from Blubasi if he has uh, also some interesting questions. Okay. Um, thank you very much. And uh, Asante, that was very good. I, I like the presentation. Uh, it's rich, it's got a lot of information. Now, um, I have some questions somewhere around the technology that you have and how you're managing some of the information. For instance, I can see from your presentation that you have a number of systems that you are running. And um, I think from what I'm seeing, you have a central database where you're pulling all this information to different uh, systems uh, in order to provide services to the people in Ghana. Now, my question is, um, how do you manage the issue of identity? Do you have a common identity or an identifier across all the different MISs? Or um, does each MIS generate its own uh, identifier? Okay, that's my first question. Then um, on the second one, because we have different systems that are running, 
do you, and I can see from your presentation that you have an ETL and a BI module, I think, uh, your business intelligence. Now, from your business intelligence, um, do we get a snapshot of um, uh, which individuals have received uh, service X, for instance, and in which area? Um, can we say from the information that you have that so many people from this region received health services, so many people from this region uh, on deep ETC. Uh, do we have this kind of um, analytics? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so thank you so much. Yes, and that's a good question to ask even. So on the bit of identification, because we know we started running different silos and different systems in silos, there was always a problem that each agencies were generating their own IP. Then we realized that it would be very difficult to match them or to probably be able to align them. So the biggest shot to do is to have a unique identifier. And then we have to ride on the back of the National Identification Authority and enforce that integrity. So now almost all the data that has been collected by the National Household Registry has a unique identifier. If maybe for the purpose of this agency, the other agencies that are running, would like to generate their own ID, the National Identification Authority wants to proceed all of them. So then we have a common identification to use to be able to identify beneficiaries. In that regard, once we are able to do the visualization or probably use the business intelligence tools to identify who, who is in this region is benefiting for other social protection interventions, we're able to do it very well because then it becomes easy for you to do the matching. So the, as I said, now across board to all the social protection interventions, they're using a single um, identifier or unique identifier to be able to identify our beneficiaries. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for that. So I have a follow up on um, the same common ID. Now you have multiple systems and in your submission, you are letting us know that you, uh, you develop the systems in silos. Um, so in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, so we have system A developed in 2000, system B is developed in 2001. So each one is, is using a different identifier. Now, isn't it possible that a person who is on system A with a different identifier can also appear on system B with a different identifier and uh, you end up creating duplicity or duplicates in your databases? So uh, in short, have you encountered duplicates and how have you managed them, especially that you are dealing with different systems developed over time, different uh, approaches? Thank you. So thank you. And just to solve that, um, you know, other systems evolved even before the National House Registry came into being. So what we did is that we looked out for the various national IDs. And it was good that some of the systems that were running were using various national IDs, like the voter's registration, the passport, the driving license, and stuff like that. But government policy is not driving that we can link all of this identity, identity into one, which is called the National Identification Authority. So now, we Ghana National House Registry is the central hub for all beneficiary types. So we are scrapping, especially on leave like this, we are scrapping all the individuals there and stick to the national Ghana National Household Registry, which has all individuals with a unique identifier. In that regard, we are trying to make sure that we would manage and be able to find out which individual or beneficiary is aligned or matched to this identification, right? As we move ahead, we'll go ahead and update all fields because Previously, those individuals might not have the National Identification Authority, but now they do have. So we go back, match up with the other identities that they do have, we confirm with that, then we update the registry. So as we move ahead, you begin to see that a lot of changes or updates will come on our database. And it's all supposed to make sure that we have a unique identifier. Thank you. Okay, that's, uh, that's an insight. Um... I like the I like the last part. Um, um, I would like to see the technical details of how that is done. Probably in another session, I'm sure Chair can organize that so that we can get to see the details. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Labasi. Thank you. Uh, and 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 Asante, thank you.
Um, maybe let's uh, let's have another round uh, of questions and answers. Uh, Aaron, uh, would you like to come in? Yeah, yeah. Just to maybe my last question and and to go back at the policy level, Asante, you mentioned that one of your challenges, uh, you know, is continuing to be on the at the governance level, getting the key stakeholders to agree and also getting the MOU signed. So I'm just uh, curious because you're mentioning that you know there's a very strong data uh, governance uh, policy. Uh, there seems to be very strong leadership uh, about uh, the unique identifier, as you just mentioned, through the NIA. So there seems to be everything in place. Uh, could you perhaps uh, share with us, um, you know, be be frank if you could be, what what is driving uh, delay, and are there any any particular aspects in which ministries are not happy or finding it hard to collaborate? Because it looks like uh, otherwise uh, the policy architecture and in the systems are, are falling into place. Thank you. This is actually a hard question to answer, <laughs> especially when it's coming from the ministry's administrative works. You know, Even trying to get this thing done was quite difficult because of some uh, bureaucratic processes, but Finally, we call here. So the idea is that most of the time ministries would want to be motivated to do their work, even though that's their own responsibilities to do or make sure that these things are in place. So it becomes quite difficult when there are no such motivations to make sure that they drive the cost. But over the years, what we've tried to do is to make sure that even though when you are identified as a technical lead in any of the agency to drive this agenda, uh, if it's on the project or even as part of the ministry, we we'll make sure that we are motivated enough to take up the challenge. If there are, there needs to be a capacity building in each, um, initiative to put in place that um, those individuals can commit to the exercise we do, we we are able to do that and make sure that at least following that process and sharing the same common goal um, as we move ahead. So it has not been easy, but one of the interesting thing that we've been doing so far is to try and build the capacity of those technical men at the ministry and also get them motivated. It can be monetary expert, it can be educational expert, it can be a travel tour to see some of the things that are coming up so that they can equally be motivated to take up the challenge. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Go, go ahead, Kingsley. Yeah, I want to add that um, as mentioned earlier by Kakwa, the MI specialist, that the, uh, the social protection programs are run by three different ministries in Ghana. So that we, so that means that when it comes to interoperability, there has to be some protocol and bureaucratic law that must be followed accordingly for us to be able to come together and work as a team or be able to um, bring systems to, to, to together and also share data. And this and these ministries and are mandated by law and then by the the, the, by being the government main machinery with particular mandates. So the Minister of General has it mandate, the Minister of Health has, has it mandate, and then other ministries have it mandate. But once it runs the social protection program and the social protection program falls under the Ministry of Gender, the Minister of Gender that then goes in to make sure that these programs are, are called, properly coordinated. And also when it comes to the um, silo systems, so this ministry also build their systems to run their programs per their mandate. So when they build their system, they have their unique identifier, they, they have their, their standards and other and other protocols they also follow. So once we all agree that we are coming together, then we agree on data exchange protocols. 
to be able to share data across the world. And as the MI specialists mentioned, the Ghana household registry is being the main point where all social protection um, interventions will pick their, their data from. Thank you. Thank you, Kingsley. That's a very, very interesting insight. Um, maybe, maybe we can go through uh, uh, also one last round of questions from Lubasi in case you, you would like to ask anything else. Okay. Um, thank you. So my my questions will will be around um, essentially interoperability. Uh, my interest is on uh, interoperability on payments. Okay, so I know from um, a technical standpoint that when you are creating this interoperability in the systems, you can have two approaches or one of two approaches. So approach one, you can look at it from the point of view of the payment service provider. So at that point, you can then say you have achieved interoperability because the service provider is now delivering the payment to... Uh, probably if your beneficiaries are getting their fund in their, from their banks, the funds are moving into their bank accounts. So approach one will be outside the ministry, PSP end. Then approach two would be you might want to move the connections into the ministry before the payment service provider. Um, I don't know if that makes sense. So my interest is um, your interoperability, where is it? Are you approaching it from the point of view of the PSP or is it from before the PSP? That would be my first question. My second one would be, uh, you have so many systems that you have maybe, developed. Maybe let's give him a chance to, sorry sorry to interject, Lewis. maybe let's give uh, uh, the presenters a chance to, to, to respond on, okay. on the interoperability uh, question uh, on the payment side. All right, so thank you so much for this question. And again, um, the ministry is my mandated on social protection intervention. And we are not supposed to do, like to be a payment uh, organization, probably maybe a bank or something of the sort. So once we are able to identify our beneficiaries and we are able to generate the period according to the targeting mechanisms, we push it to the centralized bank, the central bank, which has an agency called the Ghana Interpayment Supplement System. They run all the payment systems through beneficiaries' bank accounts. Whether the beneficiary is located in the remote community, he runs it on a rural, um, rural bank. Now, because of technology, we are considering using the mobile, um, mobile applications where you can do a transfer to um, beneficiaries who do have mobile phones. But the challenge has always been the fact that most of the beneficiaries do not have this, so it becomes difficult to transfer. But the few that do have, we've pushed uh, the GIPS, that's the payment platform system and the payment agencies, to push some of the money to those beneficiaries who, especially on cash transfer, do have the mobile phones. Those who do not have the mobile phones, it is transferred to their rural bank. Then the rural bank, because they will not have to, they will have to walk long distance to those rural bank. We 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 also implemented a process that the rural bank, with a, a bullion van, um, a deal is announced in the community or the village that the bank would come at this particular day. They gather at a particular place with their ID, the bank ID. They use their uh, the POS through a biometric order to verify their identity and their money is issued to them at a point of sale, right? So this is basically the approach that we are doing. And we do not bring the money to the ministry for the ministry to do the distribution. It's basically done to an agency who has the payment platform. Thank you. Okay, that's, that's, that's a nice uh, innovation. I'm not sure about the cost implications of uh, 
moving a payment service provider to where the beneficiaries are. Uh, but I think it's a nice innovation. I know in Zambia, we tried that once um, at the peak of COVID. We were implementing some COVID emergency uh, cash transfer. So we moved uh, payment service providers closer to where the beneficiaries were to disperse this fund. Um, though I think in our case, the cost implication I think was inhibiting because it was slightly expensive to move the payment service providers closer to where the beneficiaries are. Um, I think my final question would be on, um, you have these systems that you've put in place. Um, so definitely there was some process of data migration. Um, how did you manage this uh, data migration? And from your presentation, I see you are saying you have, um, is it 271 districts? So if you have 271 districts, you have all these systems, you, have, you come up with a new system. How did you migrate this data? Was it centrally done or each district was um, equipped or empowered to, to use the system at in migration and all of them were able to migrate this data? Thank you. So if I hear you right, you probably want to find out migrating the data from one set to another. Is that what it means? Yes. Is that your question? Yes. Yeah, so obviously those definitely will become a technical challenge. Um, we went around it to make sure that we do matching by matching especially getting to the granular data. So we once we get into a region, we go by the region, try and do a matching or migrating the data sets from one set of region to another. Then at the centralized point where now we are trying to make sure that GNHR becomes a centralized hub to distribute all those data. We match them across board. And we've probably be able to do that, though with challenges, with the assistance of the Ghana Statistical Service, and it also share with us some of the data sets. I think for uh, for some time now, it has not been that easy, but like a percentage of it has been done. And we are hoping to improve on the migration. Bit. Thank you. Thank you, Asante. I think I, I previously saw Samuel uh, raise his hand. I don't know if uh, Samuel, did you want to come in at some point? Uh, yeah, I thank you very much for the opportunity. I wanted to come in at the point uh, when my colleague uh, Kakra was uh, talking about how the payment I mean, is done, but I think he, he captured everything uh, right. So I think, uh, and that was how come I had to put my hands down. So I mean, everything is all that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you, Samuel. You can, you can you hear me? Yes, we, we can. Okay, okay. Th thank you. Um. So maybe uh, before we, we 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 go into the 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 Q and A session with the with the audience, I um and since we're a bit ahead of schedule, um I, I, maybe I'd like to add one one uh, one last question to to the to the discussion. Um, uh, since we've already covered a lot of the policy aspects and the and the technical aspects, or the technology uh, side. Uh, I have a question more sort of on, on, on the data updating um, uh, aspects, uh, particularly for the Ghana uh, social registry. Um, so I understand that the, the, the system was uh, initiated in, back in 2015 and that already has a coverage of about 800,000 uh, households. Um, and as you know, poverty and, and vulnerability are, are very dynamic. Um, uh, uh, phenomena and, and, and they change and, and you know the COVID crisis was a prime example of that. Um, so I was wondering, you know, from your perspective, from the perspective of um, uh, of the ministry that that is that is uh, uh, handling and, and administering the, the social registry, how do you think about the updating of the social registry's data? Um, and 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 in, in essence. Uh, do, do you think about it in, in a dynamic way? How, how do you think about potentially updating the data dynamically, um, given that there are already uh, multiple interoperability um, uh, elements and founda the foundations are there, you know, the common data dictionary, the management data, the data management protocols, the exchange protocols, 
so even if maybe some systems still operate in silos, there seems to be a, a, a minimum degree of interoperability amongst them. So does that come into play uh, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, updating the social registry data and, and how, how, how periodic those updates uh, uh, are and, and or how do you think them to be? Yeah, so thank you so much for this question. I, I, I definitely knew that this question would come up <laughs> uh, on a bit of social protection, which is key for us because then, as she said, um, poverty is dynamic and individuals, beneficiaries who have been targeted probably in the next five or 10 years, maybe the poverty status probably have changed. And so we need to speak to, and the data would have to speak to what is on the ground existing. And that is re the reason why we want to use the National Identification Authority. So now as a stance now, the National Identification Authority is decentralizing its offices to the region and the districts. So what it means is that we are going to ride on the back of the social welfare officers who have a close connection with beneficiaries either in the district or the communities, while they visit them more of the time. Once they do have the app, they are able to ask a few questions and find out if there's any change to the socioeconomic standards of those individuals or beneficiaries. And once they're able to go and update the data, it comes straight into our server. We run another score of PMT to make sure that either the beneficiaries either graduated from one stage to another, then we'll be able to move that individual to another category of poverty, right? Um, it has not been easy though, um, constant reviews to how updates will be done. We are also running on the back of LEAP. As I said, our data exchange protocol and needs every stakeholder to update every field or basic fields when they use the data on the ground, right? So the updates app is always available to each individual. And during payment, especially on LEAP, uh, we mandate the payment monitor or whoever is in charge of payments to ask basic questions of the beneficiaries that we've shared the data on. In that regard, we have the possibility as we move ahead to be able to update those data. But by law and policy, the National Household Registry is supposed to do every uh, update every four years. So we'd also want to ride on the back of that policy decision to make sure that updates are done on the system or on the beneficiaries as well. Thank you. Thank you, Asante. Uh, very interesting. Um, so maybe let's let's dive into the Q and A with the audience. Um, I see uh, there's uh, already been some questions posted in the Q and A. Uh, I invite everyone uh, uh, from our attendees to 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 post any other questions that you might have in mind that have, or or topics or issues that have might not have been um, uh, discussed so far. But uh, maybe I'll start off uh, with with some questions that I that I see already, um, particularly, for example, from uh, Uwe Washer. Um, his question is, and 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 I'll leave this open to any of the presenters, um, uh, Asante, uh, uh, Kingsley, or, or Samuel. Um, so Uwe's question is uh, talking about data standards. Um, did you orient the, uh, your data standards at existing international standards, or did you define uh, Ghana specific standards? Um, and if you did it uh, uh, on the basis of international standards, which ones did you look at? And if you did it more uh, inward looking uh, in, in in Ghana. Uh, are those Ghana specific uh, standards uh, available, uh, you know, uh, to be publicly available? Over to you. So let me let me take the opportunity to answer that. Yes. Yeah, so with our data standards, we did Ghana specific, but mind you, our data protection act also belongs to an international standard. So you intend to input some of the international standards into. Um, the specifics that we, we do have in Ghana. However, when it comes to data transfer internationally, the DPC, which is a Data Protection Commission, mandates you to have a legal framework as to how you share the data and to protect the data subjects. So once there's a possibility to have those integrations done with international agencies, definitely we would have to follow the legal framework and also imbibe some of the Data Protection Acts or principles um, into our sharing of data internationally. Thank you. 
Thank you, Santi. Um, so maybe another set of questions that have been posted um, on a different topic that we haven't really addressed uh, in terms of community participation. Um, I see both uh, Ilde and Abdel have uh, posted a, a similar question. Um, and 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 so so they're asking, you know, how does how does the system support community participation in the monitoring and evaluation process uh, of the sort of protection programs in Ghana, and particularly uh, such as Leap? Um, and I see Samuel is raising his hand. Maybe maybe he wants to come in on on, on this question. Over. Yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity once again. So. Uh, Maybe just a, a little bit of context so that we can put the response in a very good perspective. So in Ghana, I must say that we have, I mean, structures for coordinating and, and monitoring social protection programs across the national and the regional and also the local level as a community's level. So, um, and each of the social protection programs, as uh, explained by Ika Krau already, has their own inbuilt or program level monitoring and evaluation systems, okay? So these systems are supposed to be linked into the SP MEMIS system that I also talked about. Now, for example, LEAP, when it comes to monitoring and evaluation on LEAP, uh, I mean, the program, monitoring and evaluation is happening at the local level across all LEAP, I mean, uh, program evaluation process when it comes to uh, enrollment, uh, payment, and even case management. Now, what is happening is that at the various community level, we have social welfare officers at the, in those districts, okay? Who, for example, during payment, they also go around with their, uh, their, their electronic device that as a tablet, which has programmed some indicators and some questions in it. So, as and when payment is going, whatever issue that needs to be recorded based on the indicator, those issues are recorded and the data is transmitted automatically into the LEAP program MNE MIS system for them to also be, you know, uh, I mean, doing what um, to check and address the issues as and when they come. That notwithstanding, the LEAP MIS system, just as Kakla, uh, Ikakra explained, is also linked to the National Social Protection Monitoring Evaluation Dashboard. That we at the ministry level or the policy level are also able to track some identified key performance indicators on the LEAP program. We are not tracking everything on the program. So at the community level, the social welfare officers are working very heavily on services to support the overall process of LEAP programming from, as I mentioned, from even targeting enrollment uh, 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 case management and all of, and what have you using the LEAP monitoring evaluation um, uh, device, which is also linked to the national SPM uh, dashboard. Over. So that's so also to add. Go. Sorry, that's also to add. I know some has been championing the bit of dialogues with the community members. Uh, most of the time. So the organized district forums or community dialogues with beneficiaries within the community and sometimes share or explain or disseminate information on social protection interventions, the platforms that are being run, the platforms for them to seek redress in case they do have them. And if there are any concerns that also want to share across policy or decision makers, they do that during the dialogue as well. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel and, and, and Asante, for, 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 for your answers. Um, and so maybe um, one, sorry. Yeah, I, um, I also want, I wanted to yes. add, yeah, I wanted to add uh, single window engagement um, is also, is the main um, grievance redress system for the social protection flagship programs, which um, ensure that citizenship can report cases or grievances to the ministry for them to be addressed. And that is one of the ways the ministry engage the 
community on the social protection programs. Thank you. Thank you, Kingsley. Um, so I see uh, a, a couple more questions um, that, that I've just that, that have been just put into to the chat. Uh, maybe I'll I'll start with one. Uh, well, two. I'll, I'll group two questions on on the issue of of, of identity and, and the identifiers. Uh, both Bukola and and uh, Kumal are are asking uh, related questions. Um, Bukola is asking, you know, apart from the identity number that is issued by the nation, national uh, authority on identity, what other methods have you been using to deduplicate beneficiary data in the social registry? And and and, and this might also be sort of be related to to, to the civil registry uh, question posed by Kumal by Kumal. Uh, in terms of the coverage of the the the, the CRVS uh, uh, for for birth and death registration, which uh, uh, probably feeds into um, the the identity number uh, uh, being used by the national uh, authority. Over to you. Yeah. So thank you so much for this question. Again, our approach is to make sure that. There's always a trigger to be able to identify individuals even at birth, right? So, and the birth registry will be able to pick up those things and have a unique identifier. Will definitely sink into the National Identification Authority bit. That we have not gone, gone there. We've not gotten there, and probably to make sure we do that. But even besides that, the other agencies that do not have the NIA, we we run on all statutory documents either and the passport or the voters registry, which is a big chunk of um, one sort of identification in Ghana, because everybody wants to vote and probably exercise this franchise. But because the national identification process goes through a lot of, uh, takes a lot of processes, and has a lot of validations to make sure you are satisfied. That's why you tend to have a, a bit of individuals who have not been registered on the platform. But as we move ahead, there's always the basic idea that there should be an identifier to be able to identify a beneficiary. So we go ahead, even though we do not have a unique identifier, to use the biometric stages. So once we and any any agency is going to do any intervention and you do not have that, it's registered or using the biometrics of an individual. And it is one of the key indicators or unique identifiers that you can use for beneficiaries because everybody has its own biometrics to pick capture. Once we are able to do that, it becomes easy for us to identify beneficiaries. And as we move ahead, there's always the contemplation that and the national ID will be able to capture or register most Ghanaians, at least by 90% of it, as we move ahead. So this is basically some of the things that we use to do identify our beneficiaries, especially using biometrics. Thank you. Thank you so much, Asante. Um, okay, I think we have one last question in the Q and A um, um, that I'll from uh, Lena Blind. Uh, she's asking about uh, whether or not you have any farmer registry or disability registry uh, in Ghana, and and if those and if they do exist, if those registries are interoperable with any of the platforms um, that have been discussed so far. I guess, particularly the social registry. Over. Yes, again, thank you for this question. Interesting one. Yes, so have you had, when we had finished our instrument designing the copy for data collection, um, we were hit by this on the Washington group of questions where it considers most disability. And so we had to revise our instrument to capture a bit of data on disability, which we have done previously with the National House Registry. We intend to open the scope to contain a lot of details for the, the, the disability people so that we can have a centralized database for individuals or people who live with disabilities. 
So this is the approach that we are going. We do not have much information on a registry that captures entirely all people living with disabilities, but we have had discussions on the need to expand our scope and to build a registry for the people who are living with disability as we move ahead. Thank you. Hello. Um, please, you realize that during Hakkar's presentation, during his presentation, he made mention of the ministry's integration plan. So if you look at the ministry, it has various agency, agencies or in the department under it. So if you if you take the social protection programs, the Department of Gender will also want to make sure that the gender issues are made are mainstream into the social protection um, programs. The, there's a Department of Children under the Ministry who also will want to make sure that. Um, the children issues within the social protection enclave are also uh, look at there's the disability council under the ministry who also uh, make sure that disability issues are also handled in the social protection enclave so these are the areas that the ministry work hand in hand to make sure that no no one is left behind. Thank you. Thank you, Kingsley. Um, and I see one last question that has been just posted by Lavinia um, regarding uh, the health uh, information system. Uh, does the NHIS uh, have a separate data collection uh, and database than, than the social registry? Over to you. Yes, yeah, so the National Health Insurance has a separate database. And also have um, probably some of the data collection tools they need to collect data. And the only resources they consume from us is basically on the indigent category that the National Household Registry has. Thank you. Thank you, Asante, very clear. So I think with this, we've covered all of the questions posted so far. Um, uh, I think maybe we could uh, wrap up. Uh, and uh, I, I thank uh, very much the presenters, the discussants, and the audience. And uh, I hand over to Domi. Yeah, hi, Luis. Um, and thanks um, for the presentation. Um, maybe a quick, I'm Dominic from GIZ headquarters in Germany and part of the DCI steering group. and. I'm very impressed how far you um, progressed with your interoperability efforts in Ghana. Um, the session showed us um, your great progress during the last years to create such an interoperable social protection information system. Um, con congratulations, I would say. Um, and you have also shown that interoperability is an ongoing journey and not just um, a destination where we would like to go. Um, and it was an important exchange for us as the DCI to get a better idea for the changes, risks, and pitfalls um, of our interoperability efforts. Um, these learnings from you um, would be very useful for us as the DCI, and um, I invite you to be part of the DCI in the future, and we will reach out to you um, for further cooperation. I would like to use the opportunity to thank all the participants and for your valuable uh, contribution for the session. Massive thanks for the presentation um, for Ghana, Asante uh, Kakra, uh, Kingsley Uwazi, and Samuel um, Buaki uh, Mafo. Thanks for the moderation, Luis. And thanks a lot for the important question from our discussions, Lubasi and Aaron. Um, we will inform you via our social media channels um, for um, future sessions on talking interoperability. We will have in the future a new website. Um, you will find on our current website also the material and 
And the next sessions on talking interoperability are on February 23rd, March 23rd, and April 27th. The registration will be, as always, on socialprotection.org. And I wish all of you a nice evening, afternoon, or a good start in the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you.